The first night at Camp Scott was rained out. When the skies opened up on June 12, 1977, almost 140 Girl Scouts and counselors made a dash for their tents. They spent the evening writing letters home to parents instead of roasting marshmallows over a crackling campfire. They were supposed to spend the next two weeks swimming, hiking, you know, having a ball. But less than 24 hours after they hopped off the bus, the girls would be on their way back to their parents. And a cloud of bloody tragedy would hang over the beloved camp forever. Thanks for watching True Crime Recaps. I'm Amy. Now, this is a tough story to tell and even rougher to hear. You'd expect a story like this with a warning label to happen in an obviously dangerous place, a dark alley, an abandoned house. But this one starts on a sunny morning in the forest, fresh and sparkling after a summer rainstorm the night before. A counselor got up with the sun to grab an early morning shower before her campers took over the bathroom. Now, she was making her way down the trail when she noticed three sleeping bags tossed under a tree. She figured they'd been accidentally left behind overnight in the mad rush of orientation. But as she got closer, she saw something she'll never be able to forget. A little girl lying on top of a bloody sleeping bag. She was face up. Her legs were wide apart. She had something wrapped around her throat. She'd been strangled to death. Nylon rope was wrapped around her body and tied to her wrists. And they wouldn't realize until a little later that she wasn't alone. Two other little girls, her tent mates, had been brutally beaten to death, then stuffed inside the other two sleeping bags. Their little bodies were crumpled at the bottom of the bags. Two of them had been sexually assaulted, one of them was sodomized. This shocking case, the Girl Scout murders, rocked Tulsa, Oklahoma, and showed us all just how twisted human nature can be. Camp Scott welcomed its first campers in 1928. It was built in the middle of more than 400 acres of thick Oklahoma forest. The closest town was Locust Grove, two miles away. 50 miles to the east was Girl Scout headquarters in Tulsa. The camper slept in 12 by 14 green frame tent cabins, sort of. They're spread about 50 to 75 feet apart. Now, these offered shelter, but we're not talking anything else in the way of amenities. Basically, they were tarps stretched over a raised wooden platform and a frame. The tarp flap served as a kind of a door. Inside were four cots and no electricity. The tents were arranged around the camp in semicircle clusters. Now, each of these cluster groups was made up of eight tents, seven for the campers, one for the counselors. Each little unit of tents was named after a Native American tribe, Cherokee, Comanche, Creek, Kiowa, so on like that. Now, winding through it all was the cookie trail, the main drag, if you will. And the only nod to security was an old gate across the road at the camp entrance and at the back, the camp exit. For decades, campers came and went none the worse for wear, until the early 70s. That's when things took a turn for the weird. Counselors reported hearing strange noises in the woods, feeling like something was out there, something they never saw, but they felt, you know, the way that you do in that primitive part of your brain. And then in the spring of 1977, during a training session for the counselors, whatever or Whoever was lurking in the woods came closer, and all of a sudden, the girls found themselves in the middle of a cheesy horror movie. Tents were raided, their stuff was thrown all over the place, and a box of donuts was eaten. But the really creepy thing was the note left behind in the empty box. Kill, kill, kill. It was written over and over on a page ripped out of a notebook, and another page where the words, we're on a mission to kill three girls in tent one, signed the killer. The camp director demanded to know which one of the girls had pulled the prank because that's all they thought it was, just a sick joke. And the notes were thrown away and forgotten. Two months later, three girls were dead. So 27 girls were assigned to Kiowa. Of all the groups, Kiowa was the most remote. It was at the very edge of the dark, dense forest. And of all the tents in Kiowa, Tent 7 was the most isolated. 
Okay, quick side note. Depending on how you're counting them, you might also hear tent seven referred to as tent eight. So some sources start counting with the counselor's tent, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And others only count the camper's tents, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So what's important is that tent seven or eight, depending on how you think of it, was the farthest one from the counselor's tent by about 80 feet with an outbuilding between them. On that first night, it was just the three of them in that tent, 10-year-old Doris Denise Milner, nine-year-old Michelle Gousset, and eight-year-old Lori Farmer. None of the girls knew each other, but they quickly bonded. Their fourth bunkmate was joining them the next day, but they didn't survive to meet her. At 6 a.m. on the morning of June 13th, 1977, one of the Kiowa counselors stumbled across a nightmare. All three girls from Tent 7 were dead, and for some reason, their bodies had been dumped next to the trail, 150 yards from their tent. That's where the attack happened. I was obvious from the sheer amount of blood on the mattresses, the floor, and the tent itself. Lori and Michelle had been killed there. Someone had come in through the back of the tent. It would have been nothing at all to get through that tarp and sneak inside. The space was so small that both girls could have been killed fast with just a step and a swivel. But they took their time with Denise. There was no blood found on or around her bed, her cot, I should say. Now, they think she was bound and gagged with duct tape, carried outside, then tied to the tree where she was found. That's where she was assaulted, strangled, then left behind on top of her sleeping bags. The other girls were most likely assaulted and murdered in the tent, then carried out and dumped nearby in the sleeping bags they died in. But why any of them were moved at all is a question with no answers. Maybe it was done to confuse investigators, change up the scene. Someone made a half-hearted attempt to clean up, though. Towels, mattress covers, pillows, anything that they could have used inside the tent was dragged across the wooden platform floor to mop up, but a lot was left behind. A bloody boot print, another footprint, this one from some sort of tennis shoe was right outside. Streaks of blood on the tent poles where the bodies brushed against it was still there, and a palm print. But that was a false alarm. It was from one of the lawmen. In his horror, he forgot to be careful. Within hours, the rest of the campers were hustled back onto the bus with their things, but no explanations. Their parents were told to pick them up at the Girl Scout headquarters. They found out why from the reporters. Meanwhile, back at Camp Scott, investigators and staff were trying to piece together a timeline. On June 12th, bed checks were done between 10.30 and 11 p.m., but the night was far from silent. Picture 100 little girls on their first night away from home. Now, more than once, the counselors had to quiet them down. Around midnight, the Kiowa counselor had to march a few of the louder girls back to their tents from the bathroom. And around the same time, or a little earlier, a counselor from another unit noticed a dim light making its way through the woods. It seemed to be headed towards the Kiowa unit. An hour or so later, the Kiowa staff woke up again to more giggling this time from the tents. When she and another counselor went over to hush them up, they heard a low, guttural moaning coming from the woods behind the first two tents. She figured it was an animal, but in hindsight, the sound was something between human and animal, something she'd never heard before or since. Her flashlight barely penetrated the deep darkness, but it did the trick. Whatever was making that noise stopped, but when she turned away, it started again. That happened a few times, the moan, the light, the silence, until she went back to bed. But evil was still afoot. At 2 a.m., someone pulled back the tarp entrance on one of the Kiowa tents. The scouts remember seeing the silhouette of a large person standing there, shining a light inside. But before they could react, this stranger left. At 3 a.m., a girl in the Cherokee unit heard someone from Kiowa scream. A scout in Quapaw heard it too. It sounded like Lori Farmer yelling for her mother. But this wasn't her first time at camp with Lori, and she'd heard her have nightmares like that before. So she shrugged it off as a night terror, and she closed her eyes again. Now, this is curious. Someone living nearby told the Oklahoma newspaper they heard quite a bit of traffic on the road near the camp between 2 and 3 a.m. If that's true, that's pretty significant. 
but we're not quite ready to talk suspects, not yet. First, you need more information about the clues, what little of them there were. So next to Denise's tortured body lay a big red, like nine volt flashlight. It had been modified in a very unique way. So part of a plastic garbage bag was taped around the lens. There was a small hole in the center so a little light could shine through. Inside, there was another strange modification, a page from the April 17th, 1977 Tulsa World newspaper had been stuffed around the batteries to stop them from like rattling against their plastic cage. It was an old hunter's trick to silence an essential tool, but this twisted hunter wasn't as careful as he thought. A fingerprint was left behind. Unfortunately, it was so smudged, it didn't yield much in the way of names. A roll of the tape that was used to gag the girls and the rope was also found nearby. Later, both of those items were traced back to a recent break-in at a nearby farmhouse. And strangely, a pair of women's glasses and a case was also found in the brush nearby. One of the counselors ID'd them as hers. Someone had taken them from her tent. Now, near the edge of the camp property along a fence line, they found a crowbar and an empty bottles of beer. The beer was also stolen from the nearby farmhouse. As for the crowbar, they thought, could it be the murder weapon? But what was even more telling was what was not there. It had rained the night before, but there were no tire tracks or footprints left in the mud, save the bloody footprints near the scene of the massacre. Now, by morning, any strange scents or possible clues had been washed away. Before we go into this Any further, you have to hear about another brutal attack with some shocking similarities to this one. 11 years earlier, in June 1966, two young pregnant women were kidnapped from a parking lot outside a Tulsa nightclub. One of them was in the trunk while another was being held in the back seat. Their captor alternated between them, bringing one out of the trunk, one back to the back, you know what I mean. But he had a strange quirk. Both women wore glasses and he took turns trying them on and he later kept them because he seemed to have some sort of like weird fetish for glasses. This can be important later. Eventually, these women ended up in a lonely, isolated spot outside Locust Grove where they were brutally raped and sodomized. He left them there for dead at the bottom of an overgrown embankment covered with leaves and sticks. The gag in their mouth and the tape wrapped completely around their heads would have suffocated them. But one of the women managed to unbind one of her hands and free herself and the other woman. So their attacker never thought that they'd live. So that he didn't take care to keep his face covered. And the women immediately ID'd him as a local man. Former Locust Grove High School star athlete, Jean Leroy Hart. And she remembered something else about him. He made bone chilling noises during the attack, sort of like an animal, but nothing she'd ever heard before. Eventually, he confessed to the crimes and he went to prison. Somebody that he met in prison remembers that Gene had a weird thing about glasses. He liked women's glasses. He was always trying them on. Anyhow, he didn't stay in prison long. After a little bit more than two years, he was out on parole. He got himself into trouble again less than a year later, and this time it was for burglarizing houses while the residents were sleeping inside. But he pushed his luck too far when he targeted a police officer's apartment in Tulsa. Now, because of his violent criminal history and then the added burglary charges, He ended up being sentenced to 305 years behind bars. But when the doors clanged shut behind him, that was just the beginning. In April 1973, while he was being transferred to another prison, he managed to escape. He tasted freedom for about a month before he was captured and returned to jail. But just months later, he somehow escaped again. And this time he stayed gone. He'd been a fugitive for more than four years when the Girl Scouts were murdered in 1977, and he'd grown up just a half a mile away from the scene of their bloody murder. That was just one coincidence too many, and Jean Hart was suspect number one almost from the beginning. Now, 
This was a man who had managed to escape capture for years. His disappearing act had turned him into sort of a local legend, and rumors about how he'd managed to stay one step ahead of the law ran wild. Some said he was living off the land, like his Native American ancestors. Other claimed his ancestors were taking a more active role in his freedom. There was talk that tribal medicine men were shielding him with ancient magic and cursing the efforts of lawmen to find him. As wild as it sounds, strange occurrences started happening that defied logic. These superstar tracking dogs were flown in to help with the search, and they promptly died mysteriously. It was said that these medicine men had put a curse on the dogs. One dog succumbed to heat stroke. Another threw himself in front of a car. None of them could manage to track a scent. They'd be hot on the trail, then suddenly stop, bewildered, turning in circles, staring up at the sky as if Jean had shifted shape, turning into a bird, and simply flying away. So back at camp, investigators were scratching their heads too. Almost daily, they got reports of figures walking around the camp, but they never found anyone. They even looped string around the trees and laid sand on the paths, hoping to catch whoever was lurking around. In the mornings, they'd wake up to find the strings broken and the sand disturbed, but it all led nowhere to no one. And that's not all. Doors that were closed and bolted would be mysteriously opened just minutes later. And once when they were on the hunt and the command center was empty for less than an hour, they came back to find Denise's shoes and her pink socks in a plastic bag on the porch. The shoes and socks were soaking wet. And later, her mother confirmed to the Tulsa Tribune that both items were missing from her daughter's things when she got them back. Things at the camp were getting spooky. But outside Camp Scott, there seemed to be a little progress. So three miles away, up in the hills, some hunters stumbled onto a cave. Well, it was more like a cellar. Inside, they found a tape and piece of the same type of garbage bag that had been used to cover up the flashlight. They also found the rest of the April 17th Tulsa World newspaper and a pair of sunglasses that was later claimed by one of the camp counselors. But the biggest clue of all were the pictures of two women. Now stick with me here because this is a little complicated. First of all, you should know that the cellar was right next to Gene's old childhood home. It had all been burned out, but that's where he grew up. Now, the pictures in the cellar were traced back to the photographer, a former prisoner from the same prison where Gene had served some time. And furthermore, while he was there, he'd worked in the prison's dark room. He even processed those pictures, and he kept them because the women looked a lot like his ex-wife. Clearly, he had been in that cave, or as some people said later, at least somebody with access to his things had been in that cave. A second cave was also found. It was very near Jean's mother's home, only miles away from the camp, and inside they found a boot print that they believed matched the bloody print that was inside the victim's tent. And the remnants of food matched items that had been stolen from the farmhouse close to the camp and from a nearby convenience store that was also robbed around the same time. A cigarette butt and a hair also matched Jane, although at the time, forensic testing was nowhere near the level of sophistication it is today. But then a prison informant tipped police off to a third cave. This one, also very close to the camp, on the actual burglarized farmhouse property, and inside they found a shocking message written on the stone. The killer was here, bye-bye fools, dated June 17th, 1977. And... That was it. For the next 10 months, the police hunted Jean Hart, believing he was the killer. But the community thought differently. Despite the evidence pointing to him, the fact that he was an escaped fugitive who had already pleaded guilty to assaulting and attempting to murder two women years earlier, the fact that he was known to modify flashlights in the way that the flashlight next to Denise's body had been found, the fact that he grew up very close to the camp and navigating the deep woods since he was a kid, None of that seemed to matter. They believed he was just a scapegoat the sheriff wanted to punish for making him look like a fool since Gene had managed to escape his jailhouse not once, but twice, and elude capture for years. So the manhunt turned into the longest and most expensive in the state's history. And by the end, it turned out that he really hadn't even gone that far at all. 
they might never have caught him if it wasn't for the money. So times were hard and not even a loyal community can say no to a big reward. A tip led investigators to an old shack deep in the Cookson Hills. Now, the Cookson Hills is a story all on its own. It's a remote, rugged area known to outlaws for centuries. Now, this house was owned by an elderly Cherokee medicine man by the name of Sam Pigeon. While he was away from the property on April 6, 1978, Gene was taken by surprise there and captured without one shot fired. Interestingly, though, inside the cabin was a pipe and a mirror that one of the camp counselors later claimed was hers, but this guy, Sam Pigeon, said he'd never seen it there before. So was it actually there, or was it brought with someone who put it there? So they know Jean is a convicted rapist and a burglar and a fugitive from the law, but could they prove that he was also the Girl Scout murderer? Well, they didn't have much in the way of fingerprints, and sadly, unlike his previous crime, they didn't have any witnesses, and he wasn't about to confess, but they did have some forensic evidence. Sperm was found on one of the girl's pillowcases. DNA testing being what it was back then, all they could say for certain was that it was Gene's blood type, type O, and it was from a non-white male, Gene's Native American. And here's where it gets interesting. He had a vasectomy years earlier, so he shouldn't have been able to produce any sperm, but the operation was botched, which meant he could produce sperm, but it would be deformed. And sure enough, the sperm in the sample was deformed in that way. They also found a hair on Denise that was found to be similar to Jean's, but again, without modern technology, they couldn't say for sure that it was his, but there was a very high probability that he was a match. And that, combined with the evidence about his criminal history, his proximity to the crime scene, his fascination with women's glasses, it all pointed to him as the killer. Then there was the question of that boot print. It was smaller than his shoe size, and that's a point that the defense really hammered home. But that's not to say that he couldn't have been wearing a smaller shoe at the time. After all, he'd been on the run from prison for years. Maybe beggars couldn't be choosers. He had to settle for wearing two small shoes when he needed them. Who knows? But then again, maybe it wasn't his at all. There had already been an issue with one of the officers leaving his palm print behind. Maybe someone else accidentally walked through the bloody scene. The 70s wasn't a time when crime scenes were meticulously guarded and evidence wasn't kept in the way that it is today. But then again, what about the tennis shoe print outside the tent? Whose was that? Could there have been more than one killer, Gene and someone else, or... Was Gene completely innocent of this crime, even though he'd admitted to a similar violent event years earlier? There were a lot of questions, very few answers, but the jury made their decision. Innocent. Acquitted of all charges. Shocking. Yes, but maybe this will help explain. The judge decided that the jury could not hear any of the information about the rapes in 1966. They had no idea he had done something like this before. He was found not guilty, but that didn't mean he was free and clear. He still had that 300 plus year sentence hanging over his head. But only a few weeks after the stunning verdict, Gene dropped dead of a heart attack on June 4th, 1979. So did the jury get it wrong? Was he the vicious killer who took the lives of three little girls? Maybe. Maybe not. But I can tell you this. The victim's families begged the new sheriff to test the DNA again so that questions could be answered once and for all. Unfortunately, the samples were so degraded that they couldn't get a definitive answer, but there was a high probability match back to him. And it's certainly enough for the sheriff. He says it's definitely, most likely, that Gene was the guy. And if they had that evidence back in the first trial, he definitely would have been found guilty. Now, you have to ask yourself, if it wasn't him, then who? One name that kept popping up was Bill Stevens. Like Gene, he was also a convicted rapist, and a few people came forward to say they saw him acting very strangely around the time of the murders. One couple even said they loaned him the flashlight a few days before it was found by the little girl's body. They couldn't prove for sure it was theirs, but after the murders, 
They say he showed up at their house with red stains on his boots, cuts on his arms, and some cockamamie story about having car trouble in Locust Grove and losing the flashlight in the process. And one of the counselors even identified him as a man she'd seen at the camp earlier. But to go back to the DNA, the prosecution said that the hair and semen were not a match for him or any other suspects in this case. The only person that could not be excluded from that day to this is Gene Hart. And bizarrely, that is because of his vasectomy, having that deformed sperm. Weird. Over the years, the dense forest has crept in and reclaimed Camp Scott. In the 80s, it was sold to a private buyer, and the cookie trail is now nothing more than a deer path on private property. But one thing remains— the haunting, eerie sense of tragedy and terror that still hangs over the place. And no amount of time has managed to erase that curse. Thanks for watching True Crime Recaps. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, it would mean a lot to us if you stuck around, watched another recap, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so you never miss a new story. And hey, if you feel like giving an opinion, we've got a lot of polls and headlines in our community tab. So head on over there and weigh in. Until next time. Take care.